Per rispetto al nostro ospite eh, parlerò in inglese dando alcune informazioni circa il nostro ospite. Well, it's a great pleasure for us to have you as a lecturer, uh, Dr. Chris Norton, tonight. Uh, well, he doesn't really need a presentation because he's uh, very well known, but just a few words about his current uh, occupation. Is since 2012 um, is a director of the Egypt Exploration Society, where he has done an amazing job of recuperating the role of the society, especially in the fieldwork, eradicating in Egypt and uh, enlarging and eradicating the office in Cairo. At the same time, and we will hear about uh, more about this tonight, uh, um, putting together the needed scientific work to the need to consolidate and eradicate in the society. Uh, wh when I read your abstract and what you want to present here tonight, I had to think right away of what Montebello uh, used to say about the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And he said that at the beginning, I think 2001, and he said that no cultural institution can, has, can have the arrogance of, of, uh, to exist uh, without considering the cultural uh, society in which it is inserted, and I think it's something that we all have to take into account when we run such an institution. And I think that the work that Chris is doing is really expressing this conflict, as it were, of this custom battle between the uh, scientific Egyptology and the need to transmit new contents to the public at large. For me personally, it's not only a honor, but it's an immense pleasure to have you here, Chris, uh, who is uh, um, not only a very distinguished colleague, but um, a very good friend. Uh, it's also a honor for us because he's uh, the president of the International Association of Egyptology, so we have uh, the maximum authority of Egyptologists <laughs> here tonight with us. And, uh, but I just want to remember that uh, a few years ago, you probably remember we met in, uh, in Luxor and yeah, we were too. both writing our PhD thinking <laughs> that we will be without a job in That's our right. field <laughs> and uh, I was honored because I, I was working on the tomb of Ramosa or oh, is Imiper Hedge and Nezut is uh, uh, a high in the, um, person in the time of Taharka and uh, in the very days I was working there uh, 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 Lorai Corcoran was uh, discovering KV63 and she met Chris and she said, well, maybe you could come to the Valley of the Kings tomorrow to see the KV-63. And it was kind of, well, I could do so. And then she told him, well, but Christian Greco is working on the tomb of Ramosa. I said, Ramosa, that's where I want to go. And I, well, I felt very <laughs> honored that uh, uh, research on uh, uh, somebody of the 25th dynasty could be more important than uh, a, a royal tomb. So thank you for being here. Thank you for visiting our museum. And I give the word to you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Dr. Greco, for such um, a generous introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here um, in this wonderful museum, um, wonderful collection, wonderfully redisplayed by Dr. Greco and his team over the last few years. Um, I had the honor and privilege of introducing my very good friend um, Christian twice last year, once in Cairo and once in London, uh, as he generously agreed to speak uh, to our members twice uh, about the redisplays here. Uh, and um, it's really wonderful for me to now to, to see, albeit in something of a hurry, uh, the displays today. You've done a, a fabulous job. And um, also, actually, I was thinking as uh, I'm going to try to talk about this, uh, what I see as a tension between uh, scientific and popular Egyptology, but uh, I feel perhaps a little bit as though I'm preaching to the converted here because it, it's absolutely clear that uh, the galleries have um, been put together here very much with both a scholarly and a, a wider public audience in mind. And I think if there is a trick um, to balancing uh, the needs of those two quite distinct audiences, I think you've done a fabulous job of pulling that trick off. So congratulations. Um, so uh, what I would uh, like to do 
today is just to explore, as I say, what, what I consider to be a tension between popular Egyptology, popular archaeology, uh, and scientific archaeology. And my argument um, is going to be that at a certain point in time, at least as far as the Egypt Exploration Society is concerned, um, those two things were quite closely aligned, but that over time they diverged for one reason or another, uh, but that actually today in the 21st century it's at least as important as it was uh, when the EES began for those things to be closely aligned. And as I say, there's, there's obviously an awareness of that here. There's obviously an awareness of that at the Metropolitan Museum um, when uh, Philip Montebello said what he said uh, all those years ago. And um, so I think, I, I think although today I'm going to be mostly speaking about the history of the EES, going back to the late 19th century, uh, what I'm going to be talking about I think has a relevance certainly for us uh, at the EES today and I think for Egyptology more widely as well. So. Um, for those of you uh, who don't know, many of you will, I expect, um, the Egypt Exploration Society was founded uh, in 1882 by this lady, Miss Amelia Edwards. Uh, she was not an Egyptologist in the conventional sense uh, or an archaeologist. She was a, a writer, uh, an artist, a musician, and she had become a traveler and a travel writer later in her life uh, as well. And she had, in fact, uh, made something of a name for herself as uh, a writer of travelogues um, relating to her journeys to, to Italy, in fact, to begin with. And she was going to be continuing that uh, in the early 1870s, but the weather in Italy, unlike today, uh, at, at that time wasn't very good, and so she decided to divert her trip to Egypt, which in the 19th century for uh, relatively wealthy uh, Brits and other uh, Western Europeans was absolutely de rigueur as a, a destination, not just for uh, sightseeing, holidaying, but also for recuperation. It was thought to be very good for your health, particularly if you came from the cold and damp, foggy climes of London to go to a dry, arid, sunny climate like Egypt. And so without any um, very great uh, prior interest in the country or its ancient past, Amelia decided that she would go to Egypt in uh, 1872, and there she absolutely fell in love with the country. Um, and as you might expect um, of a writer of her caliber, uh, she published an account of her journey soon afterwards, calling it A Thousand Miles Up the Nile. Uh, she took the fairly standard uh, tour. She, she took... Um, uh, an extensive sailboat, a dahabiyya, for herself, um, complete with a grand piano and a large library and a staff and a, uh, a large contingent of traveling companions. Um, and she journeyed uh, down the Nile into uh, Nubia, recording as she went her experiences uh, of modern Egypt, um, but particularly of the monuments. As I say, she fell in love with the country and with its ancient past. Uh, but at the time, uh, she also became um, very concerned that what she saw was not going to survive for very long. And I'm sure you'll know that at this time, there was a great frenzy of interest in ancient Egyptian monuments, triggered perhaps initially by Champollion's um, decipherment of hieroglyphs in 1822, and then um, followed by the great expeditions, and then eventually... Um, hordes of wealthy tourists being brought to the country by um, Thomas Cooks and other steamer-based um, travel companies. And uh, what you might think of as the archaeologists of the day were, yes, recording, but also to a large extent carrying away archaeological monuments, in some cases helping to preserve them, certainly uh, helping to raise awareness of ancient Egypt and its past, in some cases, though, damaging monuments in the process as well. I'm sure those of you um, who have been to Egypt will, will be very familiar with the 19th century graffiti that's left everywhere by travelers such as this, um, some of whom did quite substantial damage to these monuments. At the same time, uh, archaeological excavations were exposing uh, stone and mud brick 
um, to uh, depredations by the elements, um, leaving them exposed to, to decline and, and decay where previously they had been protected, buried underground for thousands of years. And also, um, there was a great plundering of the ancient mud brick um, throughout Egypt at this time uh, by uh, the people of the countryside who, who realized that the ancient mud brick provided very good fertilizer for their agricultural land. Um, and so one way or another, archeological sites were being destroyed quite rapidly. And when Amelia came back to London, uh, following her trip and following the publication of her book, um, she decided to pursue her passion uh, for Egyptology by uh, studying hieroglyphs, um, taking an interest in uh, Egyptian history, um, making connections with uh, the staff in the uh, Department of Egyptian and Near Eastern Antiquities at the British Museum, and beginning to gather ideas about how she might make um, some kind of a contribution towards stopping uh, the damage and the decay that was being done to these monuments. Over the course of a few years, um, she gathered supporters um, and she began to gather ideas about sending an explorer, uh, precursor to modern archaeologists, to Egypt to record um, what was there before it was lost as a, as a means of um, preventing uh, further damage and decay, if only by, uh, by documenting the standing monuments. And so, this took her a few years, but in 1882, um, Amelia had made use of her very good connections. She was well known in England at this time. Um, she was quite a famous celebrity uh, as, as a writer. Um, she had extremely good connections, and she seems also to have been very persuasive. She had great energy. Um, and she was also um, somebody who was able to make use of her connections, her networks, to gather support. Um, she was writing regularly for the national press and had good contacts um, at uh, newspapers like the Times of London. And this announcement appeared in May 1882, uh, headed simply Egyptian Antiquities, uh, and it says, we are requested to publish the following. A society has been formed for the purpose of excavating the ancient sites of the Egyptian Delta, and the scheme has started with a reasonable prospect of success. Um, this goes on to list the people who have taken an interest in this scheme and pledged to support it, and they include the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Bishops of Bath and Wells, Durham and Lincoln, the Chief Rabbi, Archdeacon Anson, Mr. Robert Browning, the Earl of Carnarvon, etc., etc. So the great men of the church and the establishment, nobility, writers, etc., um, a good selection of the very most influential people in the UK at this time. And slightly further down the announcement, I've clipped some pieces out here, it says, it is proposed to raise a fund for the purpose of conducting excavations in the Delta, which up to this time has been rarely visited by travelers and where but one site, Zoan, Tanis, has been explored by archaeologists. Yet here must undoubtedly lie concealed the documents of a lost period of Bible history, documents which we may confidently hope will furnish the key to a whole series of perplexing problems. So Amelia had already gathered support. She had made her case to these people that if nothing were done, uh, to try to document and uncover ancient sites in Egypt, and particularly in the Delta. There was a strong focus on the Delta to begin with. Um, uh, if nothing was done, then an awful lot stood to be lost. And having established uh, a good base of supporters, the next thing to do was to raise money. Um, and anybody familiar with the Egypt Exploration Society, the organization that she was establishing at this point, um, will know that money has been a preoccupation of ours since the late 19th century and continues to be a preoccupation, as it is for many archaeologists. The thinking behind uh, this actually is captured perhaps most um, accurately by Flinders Petrie, um, who wasn't involved with the Egypt Exploration Fund at the very beginning, uh, but would become involved within um, a couple of years uh, he had begun working in Egypt just slightly before the foundation of the fund in 1880, 
and he said around that time that a year's work in Egypt made me feel it was like a house on fire. So rapid was the destruction going on. My duty was that of a salvage man to get all I could quickly gathered in. In other words, he felt that it was like a race to go out there, to uncover and gather as much material as he possibly could, knowing that if he didn't get there quickly enough, things would be lost. Now, Amelia and co were enormously successful, not only in raising support, but in raising the necessary funds. And having done that within a few months, they identified a first explorer. Uh, he's shown here, this is Edouard Naville, the Swiss Egyptologist, actually shown in a photograph taken some years after uh, he first worked for the, C the society in uh, 1883. Um, Naville was not really an excavator, not really an archeologist in the sense that we would recognize today, um, but, Having said that, um, archaeologists, in the way that we would recognize them today, didn't really exist in the late 19th century, not at this point anyway. Um, Naville's talents lay in reading hieroglyphic inscriptions principally. Um, he was an extremely learned man uh, and had done uh, a great deal to advance our knowledge and understanding of ancient Egyptian religious texts, um, particularly funerary texts, the Book of the Dead, etc. And he was dispatched um, to the delta site of Tel El Mascuta, first of all. Um, and over the course of the following years, uh, this is uh, a photograph I just put up as an example of him in the field uh, in 1887 at the site of Bubastis. Uh, he did an enormous amount to gather exactly the kind of um, material and information um, that the fund was after. From very early on, um, the fund also had at its disposal um, a young, uh, self-taught enthusiast for ancient history and for archaeology, William Matthew Flinders Petrie, who is shown here at Giza just shortly before he began working for the fund in the tomb uh, just by the causeway of uh, the Pyramid of Khufu, in which he lived uh, for two years. Um, Petrie, as I say, was entirely self-taught. Quite contrary to Naville, he was not a learned, well-educated man. Uh, he hadn't even gone to school uh, as a child. He had been uh, sickly and had therefore been schooled at home by his parents. Uh, but he was an enormously energetic, enormously clever, intelligent uh, man and an extremely practical man as well. Um, and I think actually in many ways he benefited from not having had a traditional education. He wasn't taught any particular way of doing things and so he had to invent his own way of doing things and adapted his methods and techniques to what he found in Egypt. Um, and in fact, Naville and Petrie, uh, I won't go into this too much, are quite opposed in their methods and techniques. Naville being very much um, the traditionally trained man interested in inscribed monuments and long hieroglyphic inscriptions. Petrie uh, not being somebody who was competent with uh, either the ancient or modern languages of Egypt, but was somebody who was very aware of the need to gather in as much material and information uh, as possible and invented new standards and techniques for recording both inscribed and also uninscribed material as well. Between them, they contributed uh, with the backing of this new institution, the Egypt Exploration Society, to raising the standards of archaeological methodology in Egypt quite dramatically. It wasn't only the ES involved in this, but from around this time, uh, the early 1880s, thanks to their efforts and those of others, archaeology as a science began to develop quite quickly. I want to just mention one uh, other individual who, um, along with Petrie and Naville, was the most heavily involved in fieldwork for the Egypt Exploration Society in its early years, uh, and another man who would go on to become very celebrated as an Egyptologist, and this is Francis Llewellyn Griffith, Frank Griffith, um, who was a student of Egyptology um, at the time the society was founded, um, and uh, was adopted by the fund with Amelia Edwards' backing as its, uh, its in-house sort of junior researcher. And he would train 
principally with Petrie, um, but very quickly uh, came to be left in charge of his own excavations, particularly in the Delta. The advantage that he had over his mentor, Petrie, was that he was very brilliant uh, with the ancient language. And of course, he would go on to become best known for the advances he made with the ancient Egyptian language, particularly with Demotic. Um, he's also the man whose name uh, is remembered now through the Griffith Institute at the University of Oxford. Between the three of them, um, Naviul, Petrie and Griffith covered an enormous amount of ground. Now, uh, by 1900, I'm sorry, this isn't a very exciting slide, uh, but by 1900, a huge number of sites uh, had been covered, mostly in only one season of excavation, but in some cases over the course of several seasons. Um, we must remember, I think, at this point that uh, there was still this great sense of urgency of excavation at this time, and a sense that um, there was no, it was more important to cover large parts of the country than to spend many seasons at a single place. Uh, that this was the best way of covering territory and recovering as much information as possible. And so Petrie and co. had the attitude that they would go to a certain site once, do as much as they possibly could, and then move on. It's very different to the way archaeology is done today, um, but this was very much the modus operandi, at least in the early years at the EES. By 1900, there were, in fact, three branches of the Egypt Exploration Fund. It was very successful very quickly, uh, not only in its archaeological work, but in continuing to raise public support. So although um, it was about as scientific an institution as there was, and operating to the highest standards of the day in Egypt at this time, it was also very popular. Um, and it was funded entirely through um, subscriptions and donations, money provided by ordinary members of the public, people who were enthusiastic about ancient Egypt. It wasn't funded by government grants or anything like that. It was simply um, kept alive and kept going because people were interested in what it was doing. Uh, and in fact, there was enough interest, as I say, for it to develop in three different directions. So the first of these was the Egypt Exploration Fund, the main fund, and this was for the excavations covering places like Tanis in the first uh, of Petrie's seasons, um, Norcratis, where uh, Petrie, um, uh, Petrie found that this statuette uh, now in the British Museum uh, had been found, and in, in fact it was sold to him by a dealer who then led him to the site of um, Norcratis, and uh, Petrie identified the site uh, as being this by that time well-known Greek trading colony uh, in the Delta, um, thanks to uncovering an inscription, more or less in, in, in his first day uh, on the site. Um, Naville did a huge amount of work to uncover and document um, the Temple of Hatshepsut at Deir bahri which you see in a series of very spectacular images. Uh, and he was assisted um, by a team copying the inscriptions at the same time. Um, to the very highest uh, epigraphic standards of the time. In fact, at this point, uh, the second branch of the Egypt Exploration Society's work uh, came into being. Um, this was, in fact, the idea of Griffith. Um, the excavations had very much focused on sites which had uh, not previously been worked at, at least not very much, um, and at which great amounts of new material stood to be uncovered through excavation. Griffith was very concerned that even the sites which were standing, which required no further excavation, were also being lost uh, and destroyed, uh, and that a survey was required um, to copy. His intention was that all standing tombs and temples in the entire country should be copied. Uh, it was realized fairly early on that that was much too ambitious and that the survey should, should be more focused. But this was the idea. And so in 1890, um, the uh, first archaeological survey team began working at the site of Beni Hassan, um, copying the architecture and the decoration in line drawings, which would swiftly be published, um, and also in color copies as well. Um, this one, uh, which uh, is now in the Society's collections in London, um, you may you may be able to see 
just along the bottom is initialed, um, you might just about be able to make out the letters HC. Um, those are the initials of Howard Carter, who was working in Egypt for the first time at this point as an artist with the fund. Uh, and he appears, he's in fact the photographer uh, who was working at Dar al Bahri with Naveel, but he appears um, in the cloth cap um, at the left of this slide as well. There was also a Greco-Roman branch founded specifically for the uncovering of um, papyri, principally in Greek, also in Latin, some earlier Egyptian scripts and languages as well. And this was led by two classicists from Oxford University, uh, Grenfell and Hunt, who we see here at the site of Oxyrhynchus, which was the site which provided them with their richest haul of um, papyri um, over, the, over, the, over the course of a number of seasons from 1897 to 1906. In the course of all of this, um, the main principles underlying the society's work were, um, whether very deliberately or not, uh, were established very quickly. Um, so uh, the society has a very long history, over 130 years now, uh, its basic principles, which are still in operation today, were laid down certainly in the first 20 years and probably in a shorter sp span of time even than that. So uh, these boil down to these four points, I think, and in some ways there's a circularity to this as well. Of course, the main focus is, was on uh, the annual expeditions, whether the excavation expeditions, the survey expeditions, or the papyri-focused expeditions. Um, it was an essential part of the process um, that at the end of each of these seasons, well, that was the intention anyway, on an annual basis, the results of the work would be published to the highest possible scientific standards of the day. Another important component of this um, which wasn't quite planned from the beginning, but came into effect very early on, was the distribution of objects. And this is one, I think, of the most important legacies of the society's work. Um, all of this, particularly the publication and the distribution of these objects, helped to generate subscriptions and donations. And it's that money that then went back into the society to keep the whole thing going. So. Although the annual publication of material could be seen as a purely scientific endeavor, um, we often now talk about the moral obligation to publish the results of scientific work. There was clearly also, for the EES at this time, the need to provide subscribers with uh, reward for their subscription at the end of the season to encourage them to give money again the next year. So the annual publication, as, as I say, with hindsight, seems like a, 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 wonderful, um, a wonderful scientific uh, step, but there was clearly this popularizing uh, element to it as well. And the publications are clearly, at least in some way, aimed at a popular audience and aimed at um, spreading the knowledge of the work the society was doing as widely as possible, so as to encourage as wider um, section of the population to contribute money. Similarly, the distribution of objects undoubtedly helped raise awareness and helped um, promote the scientific study of Egypt uh, and Egyptology throughout the world, but it also uh, encouraged museum collections and wealthy individuals who were the sponsors of museums to contribute money to the EES as well. And again, uh, it's quite clear that from a fairly early stage, the society realized that um, excavations which were likely to generate objects which could go to museums, um, which would therefore generate subscriptions, would be the best kind of excavations to go for. So there was a balancing of scientific and popularizing ideas from a very early time. Uh, it, it's very interesting to me uh, that um, the very last part of the announcement in the Times from 1882 uh, says uh, that it must be distinctly understood that by the law of Egypt, no antiquities can be removed from the country. And yet, um, not very much more than a year later in the annual report, 
um, the president of the society communicated to the meeting, this is the annual general meeting of the EES, the donation to the society of two important monuments discovered by Monsieur Naville at Pithom Sukhoff, a granite hawk bearing the name of Ramesses II and a squatting statue of a recorder of Pithom. Uh, these are both now in the British Museum collection. These are the only two objects to leave Egypt at the end of the first season, but very quickly after that, it became the practice that many more objects uh, were divided to the society with the, bless the blessing of the Egyptian authorities, um, but it meant that very quickly it became an essential part of the excavation process that material would be distributed to, to museums. This is just a very small selection of some of the pieces uh, which were divided to the British Museum. The British Museum is uh, the recipient of more objects from the EES excavations than uh, any other collection, but there are hundreds of museums around the world which received objects this way. Our distribution lists are a good uh, reflection of this. Um, these handwritten lists from the end of the 19th century, uh, in this case, uh, detail uh, objects distributed to the Ashmolean Museum from a series of excavations. Um, this is a list relating to Amarna, mentioning in alphabetical order the Ashmolean Museum, the Auckland Museum in uh, New Zealand, um, Bedford Gospel Mission, which is in the States, Bolton Chadwick Museum in the UK, Bristol, and so it goes on. And you can see uh, just from the numbers here just how many objects from one single site were leaving um, uh, leaving the society and going to all of these collections. So they made their way to museums in, uh, this is one in Greenock in Scotland. This column discovered at um, Heracleopolis Magna by Naville is now in the Manchester Museum, um, just by the gift shop in fact. Um, and secondly, publication, um, as I say, was also an incredibly important part of this. Naville's uh, approach with his first volume uh, is very interesting. Um, we refer now to the site that he worked at in the first season by its modern Arabic name, Tel El Mascouta. Um, the volume at the time of publication was very carefully uh, named the store city of Pitom and the route of the Exodus um, to emphasize a connection with the Old Testament narrative um, because the society knew that many of its supporters were men of the church and were particularly interested in the idea that the society could uncover evidence uh, of the Old Testament narrative. We mustn't forget that in the late 19th century, the church uh, and um, Christians in general in the UK and around the world were very threatened by Darwinism. Uh, and uh, this uh, new sort of belief in a in scientific evolution and anything like this which could uncover the evidence that what the Bible tells us happened in the Old Testament was very good news for them. So it's perhaps no surprise that this memoir, which is a scientific excavation report, would be very much focused on those people very deliberately knowing that they were the people who were going to provide the money to keep the excavations going. And I say these are scientific reports. As I say, they were... Uh, published to the highest standards of the day, and yet by our standards now, uh, they perhaps leave something to be desired. Um, there are very few photographs taken uh, on Naville's early uh, excavations. There are these sort of sketches providing some idea of the situation of the excavations. Uh, he was mostly occupied, though, with um, the copy of, copying of in inscriptions, but not really to epigraphic standards. These are not really much more than hand copies. They allow the texts to be read, and that was Naville's uh, first priority, uh, but they don't really give you very much um, more information than that. Petrie would change things um, quite dramatically. Um, his volume is written very much in an engaging way, um, and in fact his introduction in which he talks about um, uh, the civilized region of modern Egypt uh, and beyond it, even the country palm groves where a stranger is rarely even seen, there stretches out to the Mediterranean, desolation of mud and swamp. It's almost kind of poetic in the way that he's writing, um, which is very striking now when you think about how scientific excavation reports are. But at the same time, his 
recording of everything he found raises things to new levels. So a very simple comparison of the illustrations in a Navil volume and a Petrie volume show you that their priorities are very different. As I say, um, Navil was almost only concerned with recording inscriptions and providing transcriptions that would allow the inscriptions to be read by scholars. Petrie records everything that he found down to the very most ordinary um, objects. So for example, weights here on the right-hand side, they don't look like very much, but he found them and he felt it was important to record them. At the same time, the society was also making use of, again through Amelia Edwards, um, connections in the popular media. And so alongside the scientific excavation memoirs, reports regularly appeared in the national press as well. So this one on the excavations at Tanis, uh, the English excavations at San Tanis Zoan, appeared, as you can see, in the Times in 1884. And this was very common. Uh, for the first few decades of the society's work, uh, the excavations were always regularly reported um, and would have therefore have been uh, read about by a very wide uh, cross-section of the general public. As I say, this continued for the first few decades, and we're jumping forward now in history to the 1930s. This is um, uh, an edition of the New York Times from 1931 uh, with uh, reproducing a series of photographs taken during the society's excavations at Tel El Amarna, um, and particularly the excavation of a decorated stone lintel uh, from the house of uh, the overseer of building works, Hearty Eye. Um, and this, again, was a regular occurrence, uh, and the team and the society at this time were very clear that the better photographs they could take and the more they could cast what they were finding in a kind of sensational, exciting, publicly engaging light, the more likely they were to get publicity of this kind. And they cultivated very good relations with journalists in particularly the United States and the UK, the New York Times um, in America, but also the Daily Telegraph and other newspapers in uh, England regularly reported on the excavations like this. And again, I, I can't emphasize enough how striking this seems to me now. I would love to get the EES's excavations in the national press now. And believe me, we're trying. But um, in the 1930s, it seems to have been much easier. Now, perhaps that's because of the genius of our hero for this evening, uh, John Pendlebury. Um, uh, he's not the only person I'm, I, I want to speak about this evening, but this photograph uh, in particular exemplifies, I think, um, my point in some ways. This is, can you believe, a scientist uh, in his element, on site in Egypt, at Tel um, uh, the capital city of Akhenaten, uh, what you might call Akhet Artin, or you might call Tel el um, but in the language used by Pendlebury in the EES at the time was the city of Akhenaten and Nefertiti, giving it a kind of romantic uh, name. And here he is wearing um, a, a bead garland discovered during the excavations and unashamedly flaunting it uh, for the cameras. Um, he seems to have been the perfect blend of scientific excavator and showman, uh, or show-off, you might even say. And these excavations were um, very much celebrated. Uh, up to this point, um, of course, Petrie had done a single season at the site um, in uh, 1891 to 2, um, and had done his usual very rapid, very thorough uh, job. Um, of course, the German um, Deutsche Orient Gesellschaft had done a series of excavations in the period leading up to the First World War, during which they had discovered the very famous bust of Nefertiti in this supposed sculptor's workshop, which is now in Berlin. But there was still a huge amount of work to do, and in fact the German excavations were interrupted by the First World War, and due to the politics of the time following the end of the First World War, um, the concession passed uh, from the Germans to the British in the guise of the Egypt Exploration Fund. And so they really picked up the excavations and continued them and continued to find um, a, a whole series of iconic uh, pieces in amongst the ruins of, uh, the, um, of the city. 
which they explored uh, in many different areas. Um, so images particularly, of course, of Akhenaten and his queen, uh, Nefertiti. Um, but uh, in any case, the, the, the press was extremely interested, the, the popular interest in Egypt generally at this time. Tomb of Tutankhamun was discovered in 1922, one year after the EES excavation started. There was a great thirst for ancient Egypt, and there was a thirst for Egypt of the period of Tutankhamun um, and Akhenaten, the Amarna period. And so everything that the society was finding at this point um, very much played into the popular interest. Now, Pendlebury and his team sought to take advantage of this, um, as I say, by documenting the excavations um, in very great detail. They took very numerous photographs. Photo photography was established by this point as an essential part of the recording of all excavations in, in Egypt. Um, but the documentation in general that we have uh, from these excavations in the EES archives now is probably as comprehensive and rich as it is for any other excavation site uh, the society worked out in its history. Pendlebury in particular, who became the director of the excavations in 1930, did this very deliberately, um, knowing that first of all, good documentation would please uh, the authorities at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. Uh, and if they were pleased with the excavators, they would be more likely to allow objects um, to leave Egypt, which could then be distributed to the museums, bringing in subscriptions. And Pendlebury also realized that the more he could document the process, the more he was likely to be able to raise support at home um, from the public. And it's for this reason, it seems, um, that he also recorded the excavations in moving film. Um, this is almost unique in the society's archive. To this very day, video recording, or recording of moving images on archaeological sites is extremely uh, unusual. It's absolutely not a part, a standard part of the recording process. Pendlebury, it seems, wanted to introduce it and spent several years um, uh, recording moving images of uh, the excavations. But he took this not only as an opportunity to record the archaeology, but some other aspects of the process as well. And uh, he seems to have treated this as a kind of a Hollywood kind of exercise, creating these uh, kind of clapper boards, uh, which are very useful actually, because they, they give us very useful information about what he was filming and when he was doing it. Um, he considers himself to have been not only the director of the excavation project, it seems, but also the director of his movie. Um, and as I say, um, these images, by the way, are taken from uh, the film footage, so the photo photographs uh, as such uh, are not perhaps as, uh, as good as the stills that were taken at the time, but they give you an idea of what he was shooting. He was interested in capturing the archaeology. If nothing else, this gives you an idea of the scale on which the excavations were working at this time with dozens and dozens of men working in this case, I think, on the North Riverside Palace, um, uncovering this part of the, the, uh, the royal quarter of the city at an extremely fast rate. But he also uh, recorded the day-to-day -day goings on on the site as well. He had an extremely good relation, relationship with his Egyptian workforce um, and organized um, leisure activities for them. This is a sports day um, from Christmas Day, I think, 1931. This is um, familiar to, uh, to us, perhaps, certainly to those of us in England. This is a wheelbarrow, what we would call a wheelbarrow race. Um, this is John Pendlebury himself, dressed up. Um, in fact, strangely enough, in a Cretan costume. There is a story to that, which I won't tell you, but dressed up in his Cretan garb, but in the guise of one of his workmen. So you can see he's holding um, his hoe here. Uh, and in fact, in the film, he's shown doing the work and then getting very cross uh, with another one of his colleagues. Um, and Pendlebury, the great um, sportsman also uh, wanted to show his uh, athletic prowess as well. This is again at the excavation house. Um, he was uh, an international level athlete um, in the high jump and the hurdles as well. And, and, and all of this was part of life on an excavation. And Pendlebury was obviously very keen to show what he was doing, but I think he was also interested in giving the public an idea of what it was like to be part of an excavation project. 
And this is quite clear in something that he says in a letter, in fact, to his father. He, he was an angry person, it seems, as well, and had very clear ideas about how archaeology should be done. And he said at one point, and this resonates with me, uh, if archaeology is to become a mumbo-jumbo of esoteric mysteries, then the sooner it stops, the better. Essentially, what he is saying is that if archaeology becomes so specialist and so uh, scientific that it is only something that is uh, accessible to specialists, to the small group of people with university degrees and the ability to read hieroglyphs, etc., etc., then he doesn't want to do it. And he is at that level himself. He is a professional specialist. But he feels very strongly uh, the desire to share what he was doing with a public audience. It's very interesting. This is a, a comic scene from the film in which five members of the team are shown having an argument with one another. Um, there's no sound on the film, of course, but you see them shaking their hands, and at one point, one of them uh, gets another one and pretends to strangle him a little bit. Um, and and it, it's a, a humorous uh, portrayal of the kind of discussions that the team would have on site. But in fact, there is an um, underlying truth in this, uh, because Pendlebury, who's seen looking much smarter here with a shirt and tie, second from the left-hand side, and Fairman, who's in the center with the glasses, um, had uh, an argument, in fact. Um, in fact, it seems they argued frequently um, on the team. And Fairman was a classically educated, scholarly Egyptologist, um, very good with the Egyptian language. He would go on to become professor of Egyptology at the University of Liverpool. He disagreed with Pendlebury's methods and excavation techniques, and in fact, they had an argument which was taken to the committee of the EES. Uh, it's recorded in great detail in uh, letters and uh, notes, etc., in, in the society's archives. And the society found in favour of Pendlebury, um, but it stopped the excavations at Amarna almost immediately afterwards. Pendlebury would never work for the EES again after 1936 when the excavations stopped. The society's excavations transferred to another site, Amara West, in Egyptian um, Nubia. Um, and at that point, H.W. Fairman became the society's field director. So although the argument about Amarna was won by Pendlebury, it seems that in the long term, Pendlebury and his filmmaking and his antics and his popularizing of the subject were cast aside in favor of a much more scientific way of doing things. How am I doing for time? Yeah? OK. Somebody can wave if, uh, yeah, OK. Um, I want to just talk about one more uh, excavator. This takes us into um, the 1960s. This is uh, WB Brian Emery, who had been excavating in Egypt since the 1920s, but had come to focus uh, after excavating in, at a number of different sites on Saqqara in the 1930s as the successor to a, a series of um, extremely successful uh, archaeologists who had been working at the site on behalf of the Egyptian Antiquity Service. Um, people like uh, James Quibell, Cecil Firth in particular. Emery took over their work. Um, it was interrupted by the Second World War when he returned after the Second World War, uh, he became the Egypt Exploration Society's field director. And he returned to Saqqara with it very much in mind that he was going to try to find the tomb of Imhotep. And again, he is somebody who had excavated to extremely high standards. He became professor of Egyptology at University College London. Uh, he had worked for many years for the uh, Egyptian Antiquity Service. He, in fact, during the 1950s, was um, Britain's principal representative to the UNESCO rescue campaign uh, in Egyptian Nubia. Uh, but he was also one of the, the leading representatives from any nation um, uh, involved in that effort. So he was a serious scientific um, archaeologist, very much at the top of his game. And again, it's very striking, I think, from where we are now in the 21st century, to think that somebody like that could embark on a scientific research project um, and without any um, 
embarrassment or shame, um, call this project the quest for Imhotep. And, and he was very clear in what he was looking for. In fact, he says, in the Journal of Egyptian Archaeology, the society's scholarly scientific journal, um, in talking about um, an area of North Saqqara in which he was quite right in thinking there was something very interesting going on. Um, he talks about the juxtaposition here of the remains of these two periods, the two periods being the Third Dynasty, the period of Imhotep, um, and the late and Ptolemaic uh, periods, during which there was a great frenzy of activity, cultic activity, in the area of these very large Third Dynasty mastabas. Uh, this suggested um, to, to Emery that um, this was indeed significant and at once brought to mind the possibility that here, in this place, only about 700 metres from the Steppe Pyramid enclosure, we might discover the Asclepion, uh, the temple of Asclepius, which had been connected with uh, the, uh, the classical god Asclepius, but also with the Egyptian god Thoth and also, also Imhotep in his guise as an Egyptian god, and the tomb of Imhotep himself the great architect and vizier of King Zosa. And Emery set about uh, excavating this area. He very quickly, um, he had a kind of a Petri-like um, nose for making archaeological discoveries. Um, he knew Saqqara very well by this point. He was, he was rightly guided to this section of the North Saqqara Plateau by this, um, as he calls it, juxtaposition of third dynasty, very large mastabas and cultic activity of the late and Ptolemaic periods, he very quickly found uh, what he called a, a kind of a street of huge tombs, um, which uh, the, the, the largest of which in this case were given the numbers 3508 and 3510. Um, these were, were leveled off to create a huge, um, a huge platform leveled in Ptolemaic, late, late in Ptolemaic times to create a, a, a kind of a cultic platform um, in and around which all of this ritual activity could take place. He uncovered, in the end, millions, literally millions, uh, of mummified ibis birds, and in fact, in the end, the mummified remains of various other sacred animals as well. What you see here are these lidded jars containing mummified ibises. The ibis, of course, is sacred to Thoth. Thoth has a connection with Imhotep, which did nothing to dissuade Emery from this idea that this may be what he was going to find. He discovered um, uh, caches of um, rare, almost unique um, bronze incense burners, torch holders, temple furniture of various kinds, uh, wooden figures of gods, Osiris, Isis, Hathor, Osiris in the case of this uh, image. This is Emery himself uncovering a wrapped bronze image um, of uh, Isis and Horus as a child. Um, and as I say, millions and millions of these ibis mummies, which when taken out of their pots, in many cases proved to be extremely finely decorated with images of sacred ibis birds and sacred baboons, both, um, uh, both creatures sacred to Thoth, sacred also to Imhotep. And in fact, Emery discovered in the end um, that these had largely been buried in va a vast labyrinth of underground catacombs, which eventually became known as the Sacred Animal Necropolis at North Saqqara. And these are just two of these um, uh, catacombs, these passageways uh, with side chambers, which were loaded full of these um, mummified um, animals of various kinds. And he did discover, he continued to discover, numerous very, very large mastabas of the right date, um, the, uh, the Third Dynasty, uh, with material of the right kind. In this case, uh, a mastaba he called 3518, he found um, a, a mud ceiling bearing the name of uh, Joza, um, not the name in any of these cases of the individuals buried in them. So he could never prove beyond any doubt that any of these was the burial of Imhotep, but it's quite possible um, that any one of the large mastabas that he uncovered um, may in fact have been that tomb. Um, the one that's in the center here is, a, is uh, I hope you can tell from this satellite image, this, this is from Google Earth, by the way, you can, you can look this up whenever you like. Um, 
this very large one is uh, is 3518, which many people, I think, would, would say is probably the best candidate of all the ones that Emery found for the tomb of Imhotep. It is absolutely aligned with the Step Pyramid. Um, it's very large. It's of the right date. It's clearly of the time of Djosa. Um, if Emery had just found an object with the name of Imhotep, that would be it. He never did. Um, and, and yet, as he went on, uncovering all of this material, uh, again, in, in JEA, uh, even though it began to look as though even if he could uncover the right kind of masturbate, he was going to need this inscription, he was going to need this name, um, he was still saying, uh, I think in all probability, we have located part of the long lost Asclepiaeon and that connected with it, we shall find, we shall find the tomb of Imhotep. He was that clear. And I just want to make the point, of course, that still, even as late as 1970, excavations were attracting the interest of the public and of the wider media as well. And so the BBC made a documentary um, called Saqqara 1964 to 1970 about Emery's excavations and his quest for Imhotep. And that is also very clear that that is what's going on. And Emery himself speaks in this documentary very clearly about what he was looking for. And yet he never found that inscription and indeed, in fact, only a few months after the documentary was made, Emery, who had been in poor health for some time, collapsed on site at Saqqara. He was found collapsed at the dig house. Uh, Bates Emery, which is still there uh, today, still bears his name. Um, and uh, unfortunately, he had had a, a stroke, um, was taken to hospital in Cairo, and he survived for a few days, but eventually passed away. Um, never having completed his mission. Um, there was one further television documentary which was made um, in the early 1990s about um, Memphis, but I think that by this time, actually, for the society, the situation had, had very much changed uh, in the UK, particularly with regard to funding. Following the end of the Second World War, in fact, um, this funding situation had changed very dramatically. Uh, in 1947, just shortly after the end of the war, uh, and for the next 60 years, the society would receive a British government grant um, through the British Academy. Now, you'll remember that up until this point, the society's entire work had been supported and financed by donations from members of the public and also from museums receiving excavated objects, but it had never had this, what you might call statutory government funding uh, and from 1947 until, 19, uh, sorry, until 2009, the society had this guarantee of British funding every year. There is no such thing as a British Institute for Archaeology in Egypt or a British School of Archaeology. Petrie had an organization with that name, the British School of Archaeology in Egypt, but in fact it was only Petrie, uh, really. Uh, and once he stopped excavating uh, in Egypt, it ceased really to operate as a, as a viable organization in Egypt. And there is no other British institution for archaeology in Egypt. And the EES fulfilled that role uh, until, as I say, that point at which the British government funding was taken away. And I think that the effect of this was that uh, the grant for all those years, from 1947 until 2009, reduced the society's dependence on subscriptions and ordinary members of the public it allowed more in-depth scientific research. It allowed scientific research to go on over a longer period of time, but with less regard, I think, for public interest. And meanwhile, the society was continuing on its path, and popular Egyptology was going in a different direction through extremely popular exhibitions, uh, books, magazines, television, eventually, come the 21st century, online as well. And when that British Academy grant was um, ended in 2009, um, the society reverted to the situation in which its single biggest source of income was subscriptions and donations from ordinary members of the public. So the challenge for us in the last few years has been, as Christian said at the beginning of the lecture, to try to continue doing scientific work to the highest standards, standards which of course have continued to develop and improve all the time uh, through the years of the British Academy funding, while also being as popular 
as possible so as to raise subscriptions and, and donations from as wide uh, an audience as we can. So in the last few years, we have uh, done everything we can to try to publicize the work of the society in the media. Um, I'm pleased to be able to, um, to show clippings from um, the Sunday Times, the Daily Telegraph, the Guardian, the New Scientist, all of which have covered um, our work. We've even done a little bit of work uh, on television. I have sacrificed myself for the cause of the ES. Um, we have done, um, uh, we have made uh, television work an embedded part of what we do um, as, as a means of trying to create a bridge between this scientific work and a, and a popular audience, which frankly is a lot more interested in Tutankhamun, regardless of how many television programs there are about Tutankhamun, than it is in the extremely worthy research projects we are running in the Nile Delta, focusing on depopulation in the late antique period. We, I don't think we're ever going to win the battle uh, of um, depopulation in the late antique period versus Tutankhamun, but we have to try to do both of these things. And um, with that in mind, it, it's, uh, it's actually very striking that we have gone back to uh, the excavation films made by John Pendlebury in the 1930s and made use of online um, platforms, particularly YouTube, to try to make this material accessible. It's, um, it's very striking to me that some of the most popular work we have done in the last few years has been in making use of uh, the archive generally, but one of the most popular aspects of that uh, and one thing which has brought most attention to the society in the last few years has been the archive films made by John Pendlebury and his team at Amarna in the 1930s. And so that brings me back uh, to uh, this man, John Pendlebury, who um, wasn't the last, um, but he was certainly one of the best, I think, uh, certainly from the point of view of the EES, of making scientific Egyptology at the same time something which is extremely popular and thereby keeping the EES going. And with that, uh, I will thank you for your attention. Thank you. Well, Chris, let me thank you for your amazing lecture and to bringing up a problem which is not a problem of the Egypt Exploration Society, I might say, is the problem that a lot of cultural institutions are facing. We are, as, as Mujaw Egizio, as unbelievable as it might be, we don't get one penny from the state, even though we spent about 800,000 euros a year only for conservation and preservation of our collections. So the need to find a balance, a balance between uh, making I wouldn't say even popular, but making the collection accessible to public at large, which I think anyway is a uh, duty that we all have. Uh, the, the, the thinking of what in the 19th century, even this museum was happening, where the museum was only for scholars, is something which I think we are far away from, and I'm very glad we are. I, you know that I was working in Leiden, I remember the first person who visited the museum in Leiden where it was open was a farmer which is amazing, and I think that we should always be able to make our knowledge accessible to public at large and to have, to make it museum sustainable. And, uh, uh, well, it's, it's amazing what you're doing, and uh, I, I um, fight with you the struggle of <laughs> finding a balance. I think we will never win the battle with um, Tutankhamun, but still, I mean, we can find a way to uh, attract more public and to do scientific research, which is something which we s should have in mind. And I think that the battle is one when you pursue scientific research, but you find a way to uh, make it accessible to, to the public. And also winning the battle to, I, we, we hosted here Wilbur Smith, and when I think that he sold 120 million books in writing I must be politically correct, but I'm writing in completely uh, uh, things which are completely eradicated from any kind of scientific support whatsoever. I think that we as Egyptologists should ask ourselves a question, saying that Egypt really attracts people and people are interested in Egypt, and we could maybe convey the message in, uh, in a way which is accessible. So, 
Are there any questions or comments on this very nice lecture of Dr. Norton? Okay, so first of all, thank you so much for, you know, really all making all this come alive. And it's really, there's a lot of food for thought here. And indeed, like as Kristen was saying, this is really um, academic um, or scientific versus popular is really what we, our daily bread, what we, we struggle with every day here in this, uh, in this uh, uh, museum. And... Um, and I, I really, it's, I think this is, now, now it would be really the time where we could start a, a, a discussion that could go on for hours. So I really <laughs> want, instead of uh, just uh, commenting um, on, I, I, have so, I, have, I really have a lot of, lot of things were stirred up by your, your presentation. I just want to so focus on just one thing. I was impressed, I was struck by the, the fact that there was this interest in the Bible. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, and, and that they were either, um, either cynically or because they shared the views of their public, uh, trying to uh, use that, that, as a, uh, that leverage to, um, to gain support and attract uh, an, an audience. It's probably a bit of both. Probably they, 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 had, they shared the interest in the Bible. They're public. They were probably a little more sophisticated in their understanding of it, but they, they kind of... Uh, ex exploited that thing, uh, so it's a big. It's a. It's it's one of these grand narratives that. Um, a and uh, today it seems that we we kind of lost the the grand the, the po popular e e culture popular popular Egyptology has kind of lost that grand narrative interest. It's a noble interest in the Bible. Is the Bible real or not? It's a big question. It's a, a, it's and and it seems that. Uh, we, we kind of lost that perspective. The last one, one, one I remember uh, Professor Jean Yoyot in um, one lesson in Paris uh, way, way, way back. I remember he addressed the, the, um, the grand narrative of Egypt uh, coming from African culture and Sheikh Diop, Diop and all, the, all that, uh, that trend. And, that, and that, so this, this is this, this kind of thing. So, uh, I was wondering, do you think there is any scope for, for or interest in grand narratives? Because a lot of popular interest in Egyptology now seems to have been, uh, I would say, almost deteriorated to the level of gossip. Is so and so really Tutankhamun's mother or sister, or uh, is this really hardship suit, or we drop a, a, a tooth in, in an empty socket, and we just, uh, you know, that kind of this kind of thing? So, do you think there is there is any? There's still an interest in, in that, in Egyptology today. I, that's a very good question. Um, thank you. I, I, th I think there should be. I mean, I, th I think that, the, that Tutankhamun actually can be very destructive in some ways because uh, we need hooks, I think. You know, so our approach has been that if, so if a TV program, for example, about Tutankhamun can bring people to our website, then hopefully they'll find our, you know, our other work, our other research, and become interested in that. Um, I think the, the danger is with that is that um, it's kind of self-perpetuating, so that the, the television companies are not interested in anything other than things which they know people are already interested in and they don't want to take risks. Um, the, the problem I think that we at the ES in particular have got is that, is that our work has, has diverged so far away from anything that's really popular that, that yes, our website has crashed a couple of times recently when, when we've been involved in, in uh, mass media things, television things. Um, those people come to the website and then they're not hooked in. They immediately think, oh no, I, you know, I'm interested in Tutankhamun and nothing else. And I think that's the danger of trying to use those those hooks. I, I think they're, they're, I suppose the danger with something like, and there is no doubt that there's still a great latent interest in um, the Bible and the Old Testament narrative and the extent to which archaeological material can support the uh, veracity of that narrative. I suppose the, the great danger with it is that um, 
we we provide we we in some way provide evidence for something that isn't there, or you know we we sort of are misleading people into believing something that's not there. Um, that certainly happened with the ES uh, early volumes. Um, so so in fact that very first Navial volume, which um, m makes it very clear. That, that as far as Navil was concerned, he had discovered such and such a city which appears in the Bible, and therefore, you know, this this justifies that section of the Old Testament. You know, we now believe that that was completely wrong, and it would have been much better, from a scientific point of view, to have said this is this is the material at Tel Muscatur, this is what we found, and you can interpret that how you will. So I think that there's a real challenge in in that. But I, but I do think that we, we, do, we do have to engage with whatever, to a certain extent, what people are interested in. And I, and I do think that, um, f first of all, that scientific archaeology, partic particularly of the kind that the EES was involved in for that second half of the 20th century, moved too far away from what people were interested in. Um, but I think it's... Um, but it's also true that I think in that time that, that the, the, the media has focused on too narrow uh, a, a part of, 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 of Egypt's history. I was about to say ancient history, but actually I think that in itself is also a problem. I think we need to look at Egypt's past as a, as a whole, running right from uh, Neolithic farmers down to the present day. Um, I'd much prefer that to be the, the way of it. Tourism has not helped either, particularly in the last few years, when, we've, when you, you get more kind of checkbox, tick box tourism. As long as you've seen the Valley of the Kings and you've seen Karnak, then you can go home or you can go back to the Red Sea and that's all you need to see. Um, so I, I, I think there, there, there's, a, there's still a fight to be had here and, and trying, I mean, my, my tactic, to be honest, with the, with the television has been to, to try to, to get inside so that at a certain point we'll be able to try to make programs about more uh, risky, if you like, subjects. So yes, okay, let's do a program about Tutankhamun, but next time let's do something about depopulation in the late antique period. I don't think that's coming back, but you, you know it'll be something. Um, and we, we should be, I think, trying to push the popular interest away from these very narrow focuses, I think, definitely, yeah. Thank you. Thank you.